Oh, 
This morning, the scripture lesson will be in second. Will be Second Timothy, chapter four. If you want to read along, verses uh, six through eight. I'm leave, reading from the uh, King James version. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. Blessed be God. Amen. what's not, what we want to change, bridge some gaps in our life, and set some resolutions for some goals, right? 
My question to you is this, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. It is January 30th. How are you doing? As everybody looks down, looks away, kind of nervously. Well, I haven't broken my New Year's resolution yet. <laughs> you can't break them if you don't make them, right? right. <laughs> well, okay. So we've been talking about um, finding cadence and rhythm. And we talked about how God created rhythm and when he created uh, creation. We talked about rhythm in, inherent in our physiology, that God created us with a natural sense of, of cadence, right? Um, we talked about community and how there's a rhythm to community that is so important for us as believers. And so what we're going to talk about today is wrapping everything up around this concept of passionate intentionality. And in the scripture verse that Aaron just read in Timothy, we hear that in Paul's voice, right? There's some segments to what Paul wrote about in that, but I want to kind of break down just a little bit and talk about it in a little bit more detail. The problem with New Year's resolutions is that it requires discipline and intention and, and purposefulness and us to overcome all the hard spots, right? It gets what we don't always plan for when we make New Year's resolutions is typically they're made out of emotion. They're made out of, of a moment of passion in which we decide this has to change and now is the time to do it, which is always the place to start. That's good. But what happens is we have developed normal rhythms to our own life, right? In our normal culture, there's a rhythm that is um, very difficult to overcome because it's so inherent in our cultural DNA. And that is just simply the rhythm of Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, or 8 to 8, or 8 to 10, however you all work that out, right? And then Saturdays, maybe there's more work, or maybe there's some time set aside with family, or maybe there's some house cleaning and the taking care of tasks that you weren't able to get to through the week. And then there's Sunday, if it fits into the rhythm, there's Sunday morning we set aside for God, and then there's afternoon, and then we go back to, see, we, and then 52 weeks, right, maybe two weeks, but hey, we build this rhythm, and it's so easy to fall into. And y'all looking at me that retired, don't tell me that you don't have a rhythm. I'm talking to you. <laughs> don't tell me that you haven't developed your own rhythm for what your life looks like, right? It's different, yay. But it's still a rhythm, right? You get into these habits and you start to realize, maybe I'm not doing the right thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe I need to adjust something different. There, there's a grating in your heart that tells you something's not quite right here, but this rhythm, man, it's hard to overcome. And even inside that rhythm, there's a secondary rhythm to our day, right? I mean, we get up, we eat breakfast, we shower, we, we go to work, we have lunch at the same time. I mean, we do, we, we put the kids to bed, or we call a family member. I mean, we have a rhythm inside of a rhythm. And, and if we're ever going to have any hope of doing anything different, we have to come up with more inertia to overcome the rhythm that exists. Because what's going to happen is there's going to become a moment where it gets hard. It gets tough. And we don't always plan for that, where it's, it's inconvenient. <laughs> and that's the moment where we have to question how dedicated are we, how committed are we to making the change that we seek to make. It's no different with God, right? And what Paul is talking about that is he breaks it down, I think, into three <coughs> pieces. Number one, fight the good fight. I have fought the good fight. Well, first of all, why did Paul call it a fight? Because it is one, right? It's hard. It is not easy, and it was never designed to be easy. I looked up, just because I'm naturally curious all the time, I looked at the word, this verse, in my concordance, fought, the word fought, I fought the good fight, it means to struggle, to literally compete for a prize, to contend with an adversary. Think about that for a minute. <coughs> To labor fervently to accomplish something. And fight, that was a verb, okay? Fight, I fought the good fight. Fight in this case is a noun. What does that mean? Fight means a place of assembly as if led to a contest. An effort or anxiety. So when you put that stuff together, it reveals truly what's going on. Guys, there's a fight out there. It is a battle. <coughs> Because the enemy intends for it to be. We take that burden on ourselves. I'm just not a good person. I'm just not disciplined. It's, it's not always about you. There is an enemy out there who is very real and does not play fair and will do anything that he possibly 
possibly can, any way he possibly can, any how he possibly can, to keep you from developing and building and growing as a disciple and building your relationship with the Lord. We have to understand that. Ephesians, let me read this again. We read it last week. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Um, here it is. Anyways. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against uh, <clears throat> forces of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We read that, I think we discount it too much. I think we just ignore it and write it off. Or we accept blame for it. Because you see, he loves it when something goes wrong, something gets hard, tribulation comes, as God said it would. It's in the Bible. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Tribulation comes, and we blame ourselves. We blame our neighbors, our friends, a political party, whoever we possibly can get our hands on to blame. We even blame God, and the enemy's going, yeah, exactly the way I wanted it to work out. <laughs> and Paul is saying, look, I fought the fight. I persevered. I made it. I can stand here and tell you I made it. Was it easy for Paul? Let me read you this, and let's find out a little bit more about Paul's experience. 2 Corinthians. Just listen. Yes, Aaron, would you come up, please? Thank you. <laughs> read 16 through 33, please. 2 Corinthians 11. Partnership. <laughs> Are you in the back here? 16 through 33. <laughs> So I say again, let no one think me a fool, if otherwise at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. When I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with, put up with it, if one brings you into bondage. If one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, to our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever any more, anyone is bold, I speak foolishly. I am bold also. How am I supposed to go? 33. Okay. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham's? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measures, in prisons more frequently, in death often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches? Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the, the, the Damascenes with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Aaron used to joke around with the girls about having a contest showing their scars. I have a scar. Aaron's like, you want me to show you a scar? And they're like, no. 
because they knew that his stars were typically going to trump theirs, right? Life is tough. Let's have a life is tough contest with Paul, shall we? It puts things in completely different perspective, I think, when we understand that it's not supposed to be easy. Paul persevered and he fought the fight. How did he fight, how did he fight his battle? He stayed connected to God. He had to. God was the source of his strength. He built into his life rhythm, however that looked for him. We don't know exactly. Thank you. <laughs> he built into his life rhythm that kept him connected to the source of his strength. He stayed connected to that passion, that power, that purpose, the fire that God planted in his heart. He never lost sight of it, regardless of what he went through. He goes on to say in the verse in Timothy that, that Aaron read earlier, finish the race. How many times do we give up? When it gets tough, we quit. We don't like things to be tough. I don't blame you. I don't either. I would much rather have things be easy. But some things are worth fighting for. We've talked about before that the value of something is worth the price paid for it. And we talk about that in terms of what God did for us. Our value is assigned worthiness because of the price paid for us, which was Jesus' death. But let's turn that just a moment. What's the price of your relationship with God? What's the reciprocity look like? I don't know. I'm just challenging you to stop and think that finishing the race isn't easy. And it requires a different way of thinking and persevering and pushing and dedication and community for us to help each other. When we're in those moments, I can't do this without the people around me, and nor can you. That's why we need each other so much. Why do you else think that the enemy has worked so hard to destroy Christian community? Because he knows we're stronger together. He knows that. So we launched a Hail Mary pass <laughs> into the end zone, and guess what? It wasn't caught. God wins. Right? He tried to divide and conquer, but he's not going to win. We need each other, and we're stronger together. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I quoted this just a minute ago, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Listen, in me you may have peace. In me, in Jesus, in him, when we are tight and connected, when we hang on to him and don't let go for anything that... Any, anything. <laughs> in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Not you might have. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We know how the game ends. We have to persevere and persist in our relationship. It takes a passionate commitment <coughs> to being the disciple that God calls us to be. The last thing that Paul talked about was keep the faith. He says, I have kept the faith over everything else, over everything he's gone through. He has kept the faith. I admire that. There's some times in my life where my heart is just not that strong. But no matter what he's been through, he kept the faith. Things tried to distract him, they even tried to kill him, and they tried to force him to give up on God, and he flat refused to do it. And that's one thing we know about Paul, right? He is anything if he is not passionate and persistent. He wanted that heavenly prize more than anything. How bad do we want that heavenly prize? This isn't a condemnation question, it's just a check-in. Just check in with yourself. How am I doing? <coughs> what would it take for us to be able to say, like Paul, I fought the good fight, I have finished the race? 
Because here's what's going to happen. When you commit to these things, these three elements that Paul talked about, fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Regardless of what's going on around you, regardless of how hard the enemy is working to try to drag you down, you commit to that with passionate intentionality. Guys, I'm telling you right here, it is not going to be easy. The enemy is going to pile on you like a defensive line on a running back. You knew I was going to work in the football game. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. But you know what I'm talking about. He wants to stop you, and he doesn't play fair. The power of community, the power of communion, of us being together, encouraging one another, helping each other, holding each other accountable, getting into each other's business a little bit. That's what it takes to get us through this thing. Picking each other up when we need it, dusting each other off, encouraging each other. We need that so much. So what would it take for you to be able to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Let me put it a little bit differently. Discipline is hard. Being intentional is hard. Listen, intentionality doesn't just happen. You just don't roll out of bed and become intentional, right? It doesn't happen that way. The rhythm that we slide into has its own sense of momentum, and it takes inertia in the opposite direction to get it going someplace different, doesn't it? Even when we know that something different is better for us. Think about it this way. Paul is an apostle when he wrote this. Paul is traveling the world, sharing the gospel. The word apostle means the sent ones. The ones who are sent out to location to do the work of the gospel, to share it with people, to build the church, to grow disciples for Jesus Christ, right? And we all want that. How many of us, raise your hand here, how many of us would love for our church to just keep right on growing to the point where we are busting through the seams, right? Yes, I see it. Everybody does. That is my heart, too. And we look for opportunities to share to varying degrees according to our gifting and capability, right? We want to be like Paul. Deep down, we want that. We, want, we like the idea that we're sent. But let me tell you something. Before Paul was an apostle, he was a disciple. That's important. Disciple is different. Disciple means the called out ones. The ones who are called to be different. The ones who are set apart. Who are called to be different than culture, than society, who are set apart for God's purposes to be his. Discipleship is not easy. All the disciples, there's all these stories, the stupid questions, the, oh, the Haman go ask him. I mean, all this crazy stuff that they went through. They were disciples first. The discipleship is the hard process of rooting ourselves out, of molding and shaping us to be like Jesus and to walk more in his image. It is the hard work of fashioning us into something different so that we can be recognized as called out and set apart for God, right? Here's the thing. Apostleship without first doing the work of discipleship will always fail. Why? Because it's inauthentic. People say, people pay more attention to who you are and what you do than what you say. And if all I need to do is go invite people to church, come on, it's great, it's awesome, that would work, wouldn't it? Because we've all done that. But what really captures people's hearts is when they can look at your life and think to themselves, man, something's different about him. Something is different about her. I don't know what she has, but I want it. 
And all you have to do is share your story. I don't know about God for you, but listen, all I'm going to do is tell you what he's done for me. You can make your own decisions. If you want to come, we have a seat for you. I will save a seat for you. But let me just tell you what he's done for me. It's about the difference between the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, <coughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, even though I will be with you till the ends of the age. We can quote that. We know that. Go and make disciples. We need to evangelize. We need to get out there. But the Great Commission isn't nearly as effective as it could be without the Great Commandment. That's the difference between apostleship and discipleship. And apostleship is fueled by first being a disciple, by doing the hard work of molding and shaping your life to look like his. The great commandment is very simple. Matthew 22, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord with all, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws hang all the laws and the prophets. Everything hinges on that. Love the Lord your God with your entire heart, soul, and mind. Guys, that's passion. That's the kind of passion that says that no matter what stands in my way, I am going deeper with him. That's the passion that commands you to look at God and say, you are not letting me go. And God smiles and says, of course not. That's the passion that loves your neighbor as much as yourself. That's the discipleship that we're called to. You can't fulfill the Great Commission without the personal commitment and dedication and hard work that it takes to first fulfill the Great Commandment. This is what Paul modeled. Paul was an apostle, did amazing things, spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. But before Paul was an apostle, he was a disciple. But listen, before Paul was a disciple, he was Saul. He persecuted the church and he murdered Christians. Don't tell me that your life isn't worth redeeming. Don't tell me that. Because it's a lie. Don't tell me there's something in your past that God can't forgive you of. Don't even go there. Set your intention and go about the hard work of discipleship. That's what God calls us to be. That's how we're going to grow this church. That's how we're going to grow each of us into looking and looking more like him. Why is this passion so important? Guys, I've said it before. People are hungry. And they don't even know they're hungry, and they really don't even know what they're hungry for. <laughs> but they need to see it modeled in you, and it has to be more than just surface deep. It has to take root in your heart and transform your life. And that takes passionate intentionality, even when it gets hard. <coughs> really hard. There are so many empty words being thrown around today. Aren't there? People want to look at your life and know that there's something real. They don't expect you to be perfect. That's not it at all. But they want to see evidence of fruit. They want to see a difference. They want to see that God is real. <laughs> and today is just a good, as good a day as any to start that journey. Set your passion. Set your intention. Fight through the hard places. Know that you have a family here that will help you when it gets tough. We're not clairvoyant. We have to know, which means you have to be a little vulnerable sometimes. We don't like to ask for help, aren't we? We're a culture that just Beats that. <laughs> I can pray for anybody, but asking for prayer? Mm. I want you to know I'm tough and I'm strong because that's not what the journey is all about. 
It's about getting there together. We're going to go into communion in just a minute. And I think that's highly appropriate. And what I'm going to ask you to do, if you haven't got your communion elements from the back, please do so. In just a minute, we're going to take our communion elements together. And then Mark is going to play just, and Caleb will play just a little bit of an interlude. And what I want you to do during that interlude is just reach down and grab in front of you the Bible in front of you. And I want you to let everybody read Psalm 91. It'll be on the screen in just a minute. But I want you to read Psalm 91. If you brought your own Bible, that's great. If you'd rather pull it up on your phone, that's fine. But I want you to pay attention to something. There's only 16 verses in Psalm 91. I want you to read them prayerfully, but I want you to notice that verses 14 through 16 have quotes around them. There's quotation marks around them. Why are there quotation marks around verses 14 through 16? Because God is speaking. So when you read those last few verses, read that as a treat to savor, because that's God speaking to you. Amen? So as we enter into communion this morning, it is appropriate that we commemorate and celebrate the last day of our conversation on cadence with uh, the celebration of Holy Communion. Because the celebration of Holy Communion, of Jesus sitting around the table with his apostles, by this point they have fulfilled their discipleship, they just don't know it. They have no idea. And he shares his final meal with them, after which he's going to go through his death and resurrection, and it's going to transport them into a level of ministry that they never thought possible. If you've ever read your book through that lens, read the Bible through the lens of understanding the disciples in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and the difference when you get into Acts. <laughs> They're the very distinct transition line and who they were and how they operated. And it was through this meal that we celebrate that transition. We kick off, we launch that transition. And so let it be the same for you, amen? If you take your bread... And hold it up. And just repeat after me. Jesus, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. For sacrificing your body for me. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Amen. after me. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. This juice represents your blood. This juice represents your blood. Shed for me. Shed for me. For the forgiveness of all my sins. Thank you, Jesus.
that was just shared with me was um, I want you to just in your mind's eye with your eyes closed in your prayer in your heart picture a big book in your hands in your lap right now and the cover of the book is you and the book is the chronicles of your life and I want you to open that book now so that it's open on your lap and turn to about two thirds of the way back or so, until you get to the part where you turn the page and it's a big blank sheet. <coughs> and you notice that the rest of the book is empty. It has yet to be filled out. <clears throat> and God hands you a pen and he says, let's write this together. Father, 
we stand at the beginning of a brand new opportunity because in you every day is new. Every day is a fresh start. In you there is no beginning and no end. All that has gone in the past is covered under your grace and your blood. All that will come in the future is in the palm of your hand. You walk right beside us every step of the way. You are there for us in the hard spots. You laugh with us in the fun places. You cry with us in the depths of our heart when we hit those hard spots. You grit your teeth and you cheer us on when it gets difficult. But you never leave our side. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you that in you, our journey has just begun. Amen. Will you join me in the congregational prayer, please? Lord, I am sorry for not loving you like how I loved you at first. Yes, my love has grown cold. My desire to fellowship with other believers has almost faded. I have allowed the cares of this world to choke my love and faith in you. Lord, renew my passion for you. Renew my zeal for your word. Oh God, hear the cry of my heart. Give me a grateful heart that will not forget what you did for me. You said in your word that if I seek you with all of my heart, I will find you. Lord, restore me back to my first love, back to a passionate pursuit of you, where my heart burns for more. Amen. I'm going to ask ushers to come forward in just a moment for tithes and offerings. You probably saw it on the back of your bulletin or in the newsletter. Um, and if you didn't, don't worry about it today, but we kind of got to get into the new cadence of doing this. We're starting a community fund because we do get frequent requests from the community for people who do need assistance for um, paying heat bills and for food and things like this. And, and I think I mentioned that all of these opportunities that come to us are vetted by your leadership team. And when they come in, we, um, we, we get their, there's a way to work through Amron or wherever their utilities are at so that we can pay it directly into that account. Or we get, get uh, gift cards from the grocery store for them to make sure so we are doing our outright best to make sure that people are well cared for and taken care of, but we do get requests. And so one of the ideas that we had was on every communion Sunday to start a community fund, and we'll take a special offering for that on communion Sundays. And so if you have cash, um, you can put a little piece of paper with it that says community fund. If you don't have it today, don't worry about it, because like we're getting into this new rhythm. It's okay. Or if you write a check, you can write community fund on it and just put it in the offering basket and it's going to be earmarked for those opportunities when they come up for people right here in Ashland. Sound good? Yeah. Can I have some ushers come forward, please? <laughs> Take a look at everything that we have going on. 
We're going to do another round of blessing bags. Those were incredibly popular. Um, the community fund. Um, do you want to talk, Kathy, just a little bit about the senior care that's on there? Um, I reached out to Sandy Harris, and she does a lot of elderly care in the community. She gave us some ideas of how we can help participate. Certainly don't have to do all of it, but anything that we can support her with would be great. Awesome. And you can just call me or text me or talk to me and I can hook you up. Awesome, sounds good. Um, coming up February 12th, Saturday, we'll have an open house at Kayla and Jesse's new home. What time is that? Uh, 5.30 to 8-ish. Yes. Yes. Come on over. 5.30 to 8-ish, yeah. so come whenever. <laughs> and we'll pray and have a meal together. It's a long story, it's very nice true. Preferably gone after 10. <laughs> 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 and uh, the next day, February 13th, Super Bowl, come watch the Chiefs play. Who are they going to play? <laughs> I have faith. I believe. <laughs> um, anything else that I'm forgetting? All right. I pray the hand of God goes with you this week. I pray divine encounters. I pray that this conversation continues to disrupt your routine in some beautiful and amazing ways. Amen? <laughs> Stay worship. Your name.